Hello and welcome to the next episode of Let's Talk Brand, the first in Poland series of video interviews with world-class branding experts. Today I'm excited and super honored to interview branding legend, Mr. David Acker. David Acker was once hailed as the father of modern branding. When looking at his achievements, there is no exaggeration. David has authored 17 books on branding and marketing, uh, including classic Building Strong Brands and Acker on Branding. He is the Vice Chairman of Profit. In 2015, he was introduced into the American Marketing Association Hall of Fame for his lifetime achievements. I hope you will enjoy listening to my conversation with David Acker. Welcome to the podcast, and um, David, and actually welcome to uh, to Poland. Well, I'm uh, delighted to be here. I have been there as a tourist, but I really it's been a while. Yes. When was it? Oh gosh, I don't know. Uh, um, more than ten years ago, for sure. Okay. And um, I, I like to ask the question, uh, if you ever, um, when I speak with, um, uh, with branding experts, if they've been to in Poland, uh, or even if they worked in Poland, because um, when I asked this uh, Brenda Benz, uh, she told me a wonderful story about her, uh, her journey, about how she was working here in Poland. Uh, the same with Richard uh, Czerniawski. But you were a tourist, wonderful. And um, I would like to give uh, uh, my audience some, uh, some, some background, not only professional, but also personal. Um, so that's why I asked them uh, this question. Uh, but now uh, uh, let's talk about your, your professional background. Uh, starting with the company, because we are the vice chairman um, uh, of Profit and what Profit does and uh, what's your role at the company at the moment? Yeah. It's a uh, company that started off as in, in brand strategy, but uh, now it does uh, design, it does analytics, and it does digital transformation. It helps people make a digital transformation. So we have a group that does uh, uh, corporate culture, and um, and we have an uh, insights group, and so we're quite quite broad, and we uh, actually get into uh, a business strategy and uh, and we get into customer experience. So the company when I joined had 18 people and now we have 600 over 600 and wow. we have uh, gee uh, one, two, three, four, four or five offices in Europe. Anyway, uh, so it's uh, it's a pretty ambitious company. We have uh, um, really quite expanded. And my role is is really to uh, to be a resource in case some uh, people need it for their engagements. But the most the, most of all, what I do is I, I write blogs and I write books and I write articles, but uh, mostly books. So I spend most of my time book writing books and uh, uh, my current book I'm working on is the future of purpose-driven branding and how you have to incorporate uh, social problems and issues into your, your, uh, into your purpose, your strategy and your culture and uh, have a place for it. And, and within that, you have to create signature branded efforts and use them to uh, enhance the brand of a business, but also to make impact. And the one before that was uh, owning game-changing subcategories where I looked at disruptive innovation and, and said that branding has a big role to play and most of the books on that subject don't include branding. And uh, so a brand needs to uh, uh, be the exemplar for the new disruptive innovation. It needs to position that in the marketplace. It needs to scale it fast and it needs to create barriers. 
And then the the book before that was creating signature stories. And the idea is there communicating the digital age where there's so much information overload, so much media clutter, so much uh, uh, disinterested audiences that you need stories to break through to, to actually communicate. Um, you've already wrote 17 books? Yeah, 17 or 18. Or 18. Are there, so are there any new books coming? Yes, it's that one on uh, on uh, the future of game changing uh, uh, brand uh, uh, the the future of purchase driven branding. That's when, the newest when, one. That'll be out next fall. Oh, really? Wonderful! This is actually this is incredible that even at eighty four, uh, you are an active consultant. You are a writer, and we can we can have this conversation. This is amazing. And I'm absolutely, absolutely, really, really honored. And I was, I was so excited before this conversation that my hands were shaking <laughs> before this, this meeting. This, this, this is amazing. Well, right um, um, how your professional uh, career started and uh, when and why you became so obsessed with, uh, with, with branding? Well, as an undergraduate, I took a course in in advertising that was a case course and it was really intriguing to me and it seemed to touch on a lot of interesting uh issues and uh and then i i got a uh a phd later in marketing and uh uh i was a kind of a uh a statistician i uh that i was the quantitative side of marketing so i built all kinds of of uh, statistical models of, uh, of things. And, uh, and, and then, uh, after a while I got into strategy, I wrote a book on, on marketing strategy. And then I, I sort of decided that businesses were too short sighted. They too were focused on short term financials and they needed instead to build assets. And so that's when I turned to branding. I decided that, that given my background in market research and, uh, in consumer behavior and uh, a business strategy and, and so on that I was best suited to uh, to work on that particular uh, business asset and branding. And so I started, uh, uh, I would drift it into branding and I, and I, my first book kind of defined what brand equity was and my second book, uh, the building strong brands sort of talked about how you build brands how you create brand equity. And then my, my, uh, my fourth book, which was kind of a, uh, still remains a very unique, uh, take on a topic nobody else has written on. And that is, is brand portfolio strategy. And, uh, which is a, a messy area, but, uh, of all my books, that probably is the one that, that stands out as the most unique. Um, I like to ask these questions when I when I have um, uh, have uh, this, this interviews. Uh, what's your definition of brand and branding? Well, um, a brand is just something that reflects who's responsible for it, who made it. And we've had brands all the way back into antiquity. You know, somebody was making bricks, and he and he branded it so they know who made the bricks. And uh, uh, so what I focus on is the, uh, is brand equity. And uh, so that's what I've defined. And, uh, uh, and that consists of basically three things. It consists of, of uh, visibility and credibility. And uh, second thing is uh, sort of brand image, what people think of you. And the third thing is brand loyalty. And, uh, and that's the connection you make with your customer base. And that at the time I came out with the, uh, that definition, nobody else was including brand, uh, loyalty as a part of brand equity. They always said that that's a output of brand equity. That's what brand equity influences because brand equity is awareness and image. And so, uh, I think that that really changed uh, uh, brand equity. It, it made it more strategic. 
it uh, gave marketing a seat at the executive table. It it uh, uh, it was no longer something that you could uh, delegate to a tactical team. So the the unique part of your definition is loyalty. Yes. Okay. Um, so well, I've often I've always uh, also expanded the definition of, of, of awareness. And I talk now in, in terms of, of being relevant. I wrote a book on brand relevance and uh, and the owning game changing subcategories have a lot of that content in it. And uh, to be relevant, you need to be visible and credible. So that's a little uh, different than uh, just being aware of. Actually, you've almost skipped to my next question, but I would like to focus a little bit on, on loyalty before before uh, I would like to ask you about uh, how to uh, well, how we can just, increase relevance. As an aside, I every year I comment on a huge brand equity uh, study that's done in Japan. They measure a thousand brands, and they have uh, tens of thousands of respondents, and they do this on you know, about sixteen dimensions. And uh, this year, uh, an astounding thing happened. There was a, uh, a company called Nishan, and uh, and one of their products, Cup Noodles, and another one of their brands, all shot up in the uh, in the ratings. It's it's extraordinary. Out of a thousand brands, usually only about a dozen change much, and uh, and this changed very dramatically. And it's so unusual to have three brands in one. But if you look at how it did it, it was all about visibility and energy and, and credibility because uh, one of their key brands, Cup Noodle, had a uh, 50th anniversary. And they did all kinds of things throughout the year to celebrate that anniversary, which resulted in a lot of, of uh, visibility, a lot of energy and uh, and. And as a result, the brand shot up, but also the business shot up. They their business did really well that year. Um, okay, let, let's go back a little bit about to loyalty. Uh, who is to be loyal? Uh, I mean, we all want to have a loyal customers, uh, but in my opinion, uh, the company that should be loyal to prospect uh, to his or her needs, to his or her ambitions. And so what's your opinion on that? Because business often talks that well, we want to have uh, loyal clients, but I think that the business should be loyal to clients, not the other way around. Um, well, that's sort of a little different question, but uh, loyalty is really, really important because, uh, f f uh, well, first of all, there's several levels of loyalty. You can just have somebody that is uh, buys the same thing every time not because they like it, but it's okay. Why should they change? Uh, that's one form of loyalty. And then you can have uh, loyalty of people that, that really like it, but uh, it's not, not, very, not a very important part of their life. And there's not something they would ever talk about. And, uh, and third are those people that are more involved, more intense, and, and they would... Uh, um, go out of their way or pay more money just to have this brand because they simply think it's better. And then at, at the final level, there's those people that are just passionate about the brand and they talk about the brand to others and they, they look forward to using the brand and it becomes a part of their life cycle, lifestyle. They have, it gives them self-expressive benefits. It's about who they are. So, uh, uh, so you always want to have as, as, as large a population as you can at these upper levels. And if you can achieve that, it's, it's really extraordinary what that buys you in terms of long-term profitability, in terms of ability to innovate, in, a, in a terms of, of being able to leverage your innovation and to leverage your, uh, your communication. It's, uh, it, it creates a, an incredible strategic barrier to others. Um, okay, so now we can skip to um, uh, to, uh, to, to, to to relevance. Um, there's uh, on, um, 
this is the sentence from uh, from the uh, profit brand relevance uh, index uh, report uh, report uh, relevant brands find their way into people's hearts by continually doing what seems impossible um how brands can increase uh, relevance and actually why relevance matters well that statement really i think applies uh to uh an interpretation of well uh, relevance that's it's in, that's similar to brand loyalty so what they're really saying is that i think that that brand loyalty is uh um you know is is an end product that you want to reach and uh for all the reasons that i've mentioned uh that uh, it's just such a strategic asset okay all right um uh, i have some kind of academical questions um, um but there is a reason for that um what is the uh, what is the evolution of branding and how has branding changed uh, over time well quite dramatically branding really started in 1932 when uh, a brand manager at procter gamble wanted to have to hire two people to staff people to help them and the company said why would you need staff people and uh, he wrote a three-page memo uh, on a rainy Friday morning, that uh, which was uh, he broke the rule at Procter and Gamble. You could only write a one-page memo. He wrote a three-page memo, and he explained what these people would do. And what they would do is they would look at data, and they'd find places where the brand was weak or falling, and then they would they would go in there and. Uh, find out why and correct it. And usually it was because they needed a lower price or they needed a promotion or they need some advertising. It was very tactical, very short-term oriented. And that was a Procter Gan uh, Gamble branding model and it lasted for 50 years or so. And, uh, and then when brand equity came in, then, uh, then things changed it became instead of tactical it became strategic it became uh, uh something that was under the purview of the chief marketing officer the vice president of marketing who was seated seated at the executive table it was no longer relegated to mid-level advertising managers and uh and it, so that just really changed marketing and uh changed branding um and it also uh it was it changed the 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 things you did as a brand i mean you did things to build up the brand equity and you didn't worry so much about sales next week and and it, it changed the way you measured branding it, instead of measuring it by current you know sales and profits you measured it by uh what it was doing to your your visibility your image and your loyalty okay um okay so what do you think is going to be the future of branding so where we are now and what do you think is going to be in the future well i i think that my last three books encapsulate my view of the future i mean it starts out with the the future is it's harder and harder to break through to communicate so you need to understand stories and you need to figure out how to use stories and I don't mean a bland, watered down stories as many B2B companies have. I mean stories that have a, what I call a wow factor. It's uh, wow, you have to, you have to, you know, uh, I have to share this story with you because it's so interesting, so entertaining, so informative, so intriguing, or, or so something that it's, it's something you've got to know about. And uh, it's it's got to also have a strategic message, it can, or it can motivate a strategic message, or it can illustrate a strategic message. But it's it's that's its role is to uh, communicate or reinforce a strategic message. And and uh, one of the things story does is it diverts people from counter arguing. When you you have a selling message, people say yes but, and then they argue back. 
but you don't do that with a story. It's just a story. And the second thing is uh, represented by my second book, the uh, owning game changing subcategories. And, and there's just no doubt. First of all, the only way to grow, and you can look at all kinds of markets. The only way to grow is to have uh, a disruptive innovation where you're creating whole new subcategories. You're creating must haves that customers use to define what they're buying. And uh, it's it's the only way to grow. I mean, there's some exceptions, but not many. And uh, so, and 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 the reality is that this this process is is greatly accelerated because of digital. Now we have the Internet of Things, we have e-commerce, we have websites, and uh, we have the Internet, and so uh, the. The, the opportunity to create and put in a market subcategories now is so much greater that you're you're seeing them happening with with bewildering uh, frequency and they just change everything in the marketplace. So a lot of what you're doing is is uh, uh, you know you know you're often becoming not relevant because that you can't keep up, and if you're a leader you're just taking over and you're growing. Um, so I think that in the future, that's really important. And branding has got to be there. As I said, it's got to be there to become the exemplar, to manage the subcategory, to, uh, to scale the subcategory, to build barriers. And finally, uh, when I'm working on my newest book that will be out next fall, The Future of Purpose-Driven Branding, is the, uh, is the fact that companies need to have a, uh, an ability to address societal problems and issues. They, they can no longer sit on the sidelines. Employees demand it most of all, but so do other stakeholders. And, uh, and the reality is that companies are, are well suited to make contributions. They have agility, they have resources, they have the knowledge of the marketplace. And so uh, that's going to change branding a lot because now, uh, you know, branding has to uh, make these efforts effective, but also branding has to use these efforts to enhance a business brand. Because if they can do that, they'll get a commitment of support, access to money and, and as, uh, other resources to do a better job and a long-term commitment. If they can, you know, not be a, a drain on profits, but, but actually can contribute to it. So how not to bore people, how actually to find this wow factor? Is this something that follows brand idea or is there any recipe for finding wow factor? Um, I, I th if we're, we're talking now about stories, stories that, uh, that are just amazing. Uh, there's no sort of, uh, a set of rules that guide you. I mean, there you can have a wow factor for different things. Something can be so humorous, so funny. Something, something can be so offbeat, so intriguing, so different. Something can be so informative that it's going to really, uh, you need to know about this. And uh, so there's a lot of avenues that, uh, that can get you there. Uh, Basically, if you hear a story and you have to ask, it, it probably doesn't have it. You, you sort of know it when you see it kind of thing. But, uh, you know, if, if, if one issue is it memorable. You know, there was a story in 1986. There was a, a middle manager at a failing appliance manufacturer in China. And, and he was asked to take over the CEO to see if he could save the company. And so he did that, and, 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 and his first week, some customers came in and said they have a, a problem, a defective appliance. And he said, no problem, we'll go to the uh, warehouse and get you a new one. And they went to the warehouse, and 70% of the stock was defective. So he brought that all to the factory floor, and he had his employees take sledgehammers and destroy them. And he said, from now on, we're building quality stuff. We're not going to have any defectives. And that started uh, that company on a, 
on, on a, a different road. That company is now the leading um, appliance manufacturer in the world. Its name is Hire. And, uh, and, and the people at Hire all know that story. They've got it in a museum in their headquarters in China, uh, that the, the sledgehammer that was used. And all they have to do is talk about the sledgehammer and, and you don't have to have at Hire, you don't have to have a lecture on quality. It just takes to remind you to that story. So that story has a wow factor. Okay. And um, you used the word uh, at the beginning of our conversation, um, uh, strategy. And I think there's a lot of misunderstanding. Uh, so if you could explain what is the difference between um, business strategy and uh, brand or branding strategy? Well, they're closely related. Uh, a brand strategy is there to enable a business strategy. So if the business strategy needs to change, the brand strategy needs to adapt. So it's, it's the business strategy is not there to, to build a brand strategy. And so, uh, so when you're developing a, a brand strategy, the, uh, uh, probably the most important question is what is the business strategy not only now, but going forward, because you want to have a brand strategy in place that will support that business strategy. That's the job of the, of the brand. Okay. And, um, what advice would you give, um, let's go, go, go back to basics. What advice would you give someone? Let's imagine I'm coming to you and telling you that I'm going to open a coffee shop. Uh, because I love coffee, I know how to make a good coffee, but it doesn't mean that I'm going to be visible. Uh, it doesn't mean that people are going to come to me and I need to find the right brand idea um, to be visible, to be different, uh, to be relevant. And uh, actually, what questions should I answer uh, to find a brand idea or to build a brand? What is the beginning? Well, I, I think that, I, well, I think three things. One, I think is try to find something unique. It may be the way you serve it or the taste or a particular, um, um, you know, particular thing. You know, I, I was, we was talking last night to my friends in Japan about a cup noodle and, and what they've done. One of the things they do, they create a, a museum or a playground where kids can come in and make their own, uh, they, they can make, they can see how, cup noodle is made and they can make their own. It can be different flavors and they can fine tune it so they can make their own. Uh, so cup noodles find a lot of ways to make that simple thing uh, unique for them. Uh, so find something unique. And I think the second thing is to, uh, to, is to build up the loyalty of the customer base and to, and to create a customer experience that's so appealing that people will come back on a regular basis. And uh, so think through the customer experience uh, from the moment they walk in the door to the moment they leave and, and talk to their friends and create a really good customer experience because if they build up a loyal customer base, that will be a basis for growing because they'll talk to others about it. Um, and uh, uh, let's see. What was I, I was going to say one more thing. I can't remember what it was, but anyway, that's, that's really be something unique and really, uh, be careful of your, of your, uh, uh, customer base and try to nurture that. Okay. But I think the people, uh, the entrepreneurs struggle to find this uniqueness. So how to find it? Is there any process or, um, any tip how to, how to find this? By, I don't know, well, by comparing oh, oh, myself I, to competitors. I, yeah. There is one more thing you can do, and that is to find coffee shops, not necessarily in your town, not even in your country, but find coffee shops that are really successful and look and see what they did. And you'll probably find some ideas for something unique. You'll probably find some ideas about how to create a great customer experience. And that's it. That's it. You know, I'm asked a looks, lot. Looks of times, easy. How can I? How can I build a great brand? How can I? Uh, 
you know, do better. And I give them the following answer. I can tell you how to do it. That is absolutely a hundred percent sure to work without question. And, uh, and that is find somebody that's done it well and then adapt whatever they did. Okay. Just looking for an inspiration. Um, uh, looking for what people expect and trying to do something unexpected. So maybe that's the, uh, that's the, um, idea. And, um, uh, actually, uh, okay. When we have this idea, uh, when we have something special and unique, and, uh, then we have to be visible and then we have to reach, uh, reach people. So then we are talking about the marketing, I guess. Um, well, I think that one thing you can, you can do, and, and many people fail to do this, is to brand it. Give it a brand name, whether it's a, a flavor or an, a part of the experience or something. Um, there was a, 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 a nonprofit that provides showers for homeless people. And they, they branded the, uh, the interaction they had with their clients. So you can, if you have something that's really important and, uh, and it's unique and you can own it, you can brand it. Okay. One more question, David, um, uh, at the end um, of this conversation, uh, do you think brands, or maybe this is something that's happening now, um, will put ethics and uh, social uh, responsibility, uh, responsibility ahead of profits? Oh, that's a really good question. I think there's a, uh, a, a, a trade-off for one thing, a lot of things you can do in the social and environmental world can add to profits. And the primary way they can do that is, well, some of them can, some environmental things can reduce costs, but besides that, the primary way they do that is to enhance a business brand because people will have more likely to have a positive opinion of a business brand if they know they're doing good things out there. And so uh, that can mean that, that there's no sacrifice between the two. However, the reality is that you come down to, you know, you using plastic containers, it's bad for the environment, but it would be very expensive not to, and your customers might leave you because others, they prefer plastic. So it, it, it becomes a, a, you know, a, a, a problem. And, and the answer is that there's no simple answer. You can't say that I'm going to be a purist. And if it's any, any, uh, and since I'm interested in the environment, if there's any damage, I will not do that. And, uh, that, you know, if you take that, uh, argument, you might be uh, so far ahead of the game that you lose customers that you uh, uh, ultimately it could be you go out of business. Now, if you go out of business, your capacity to help the environment and, uh, and address other social problems are gone. So you want to stay in business. You want to not only that, you want to thrive, you want to grow and you want to be healthy because then you can do more. So you, you have to be, uh, you know, you have to take a strategic view, a long-term view, and you have to look at the, the total system. And, and often the second or third order effects are easy to ne neglect. And one third order effect might be, I go out of business because I did this. So you've got to, you've got to take the bigger picture. Okay. Thank you, David. Uh Thank you for your time, for sharing your knowledge with Polish entrepreneurs, marketers, and students and, and as well. Um, it was absolutely a pleasure um, to have you, uh, have you here and have this conversation. And uh, actually, thank you uh, for being a part of my, my Polish branding uh, revolution. Thank oh, you so good. much. My pleasure. Okay, uh, one more thing. When can we, where can we follow you? Uh, I, um, my blog is on, I think uh, if you go davidocker.com, you can get it at, or, or Ocker on branding. If you, if you Google Ocker on branding, I think you'll get there. It's within the profit website.
profit.com, P-R-O-P-H-E-T. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, David. Bye. Bye.